This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This chapter is going to go through and look at dividend theory. Now, the chapter is entitled Corporate Dividend Policy. But I think the best way to go through and think about it is looking at the theories behind the level of dividends that we are going to pay as a business to the shareholders and whether or not that pattern of dividends that we pay has any bearing on the wealth of the shareholders. And what we're going to go through and do is, as I said, look at two theories. So when we're looking at the theories, there are two to be whole. Okay, so what we're going to look at first of all uh, is m and uh, so Medigliani and Miller's theory on dividends. And then we'll go through that. And begin to then look at the traditional theory on dividends. Before we then go through there and discuss what level of dividends should we actually pay. Now the key bit is that it is all very theoretical. Therefore there are assumptions. And some of those assumptions will not hold. And if they don't hold that then means that the theory doesn't hold, does it? But like with most theories, we're allowed to make assumptions. And if we keep those assumptions in place, then the theory does actually work. OK, but it's just the level of assumptions that might not be theoretically correct in today's modern world. So what we've got there, if we look at M&M, Medigliani and Miller, I think it's their 1963 theory. If memory serves me right, you can correct me upon that if I am so wrong. But the key thing that Medigliani and Miller found with their theory is that they went through that and stated that the pattern of dividends is irrelevant. Okay, so when we're looking at paying out a dividend, out of our business's earnings, it doesn't matter what the level of the dividend is from one year to the next, the shareholders will be indifferent. And if they are indifferent about that level or pattern of dividend, then the share price will not be changed. OK, uh, let's just explain that in a little bit of detail. So we're saying that a company pays out a dividend of 10 cents per year this year based upon its level of profits. Next year, the company uh, makes more profits than what it did this year, uh, has less to invest in terms of new projects. So therefore, therefore, pays out a much higher level of dividend. So throws it up there to 20, 25 cents per share. OK, uh, the following year. Then what happens is that the company then has more to invest in uh, because it has made higher profits. So therefore it decides, well, let's keep some money back within the business and use that to finance those new projects in the future. So the dividend has now fallen. So it's gone from, say, 10 cents up to 25 cents. And now it's dropped down to, to five cents per share. OK, now what Medigliani and Miller said was that that pattern, the fact that it's gone up, it's gone down, it's gone up, it can go down is irrelevant. It makes no difference to shareholder wealth. And the reason why that they went through and assumed that was that they said that the value of the business is the present value of the future dividends. OK, looking at the dividends received in the future, discounting it back to present value. That should therefore in present value terms remain the same regardless of the level of dividends. And the reason why is because when you take that dividend and invest it in your positive MPV project, then you are generating the wealth for those shareholders. So unless the business can go through and find something alternative to do to the dividend. OK, so unless it can go through there and find a positive MPV project and invest that money to generate that positive MPV project, then it should pay the money out as a dividend. OK. So if you can find something to do with the money that's been generated from the earnings, invest it. But invest it to give the shareholder the required rate of return that they require. And if you're giving the required rate of return that that shareholder requires, 
then fine. Okay, they will be indifferent. They will be happy knowing that they will then get a higher return in the future once that money has been invested. Okay, however, that does just go through there and create some issues, doesn't it? Uh, because if you are a shareholder and you were relying on that dividend income and all of a sudden that dividend is withheld, because there is a positive MPV project that the business is going to invest in, then you've got no cash. Okay, that dividend is not received by you, the shareholder. So what the Medigliani and Miller argue then? Well, they argue that you could go through there and create your own income by selling the shares, and you would therefore be no worse off in terms of wealth because you're selling the shares without any transaction costs. Okay, so there's no buying and selling costs when it comes to selling the shares. It, it's a perfect substitute, substituting dividend income for capital growth on the share. However, as well, there's other assumptions there in that you will then be indifferent in terms of how you are taxed because if you get dividend income, then you will go through there and have income tax. Yeah, but that will then be taxed differently if you're subject to, to some form of capital gains tax. So what we have to go through and do there is we assume that there are no transaction costs. Because that will ensure that when you sell your share to generate you that cash income, you will not lose out on wealth by paying broker fees. And also that there is no tax, okay? Uh, because if there is tax, you will be indifferent between capital growth and uh, is it your dividend income in terms of how you are planning your tax efficiently, okay? Also as well, uh, they assumed that the shareholders have perfect information because if your dividend is being cut, and the, the, the business announced that your dividend is being cut because they are investing in positive MPV projects. You need to have all the information about what that MPV project actually is, how much wealth is going to be created, and when you will get that return in terms of the increased wealth. Okay, So it's fine to hold back the dividend as a business, provided that you are giving perfect information and that that money is being invested to give the required rate of return for those equity shareholders it will be if you invest it in positive mpv projects and if you therefore pay out a higher dividend at some point in the future okay so key thing that we can take from that is that with m&m there's that pattern of dividends is irrelevant it's not saying the dividend itself is irrelevant it's saying that the pattern is irrelevant provided therefore then that you go through and pay a higher dividend in the future to compensate for the fact that you did not receive that dividend today. So what we can go through and do that is to bring in, if you like, a, a final conclusion. Is that what we should be doing that is that we should invest in all of our positive MPV projects. And then what we go through and do there is we pay out the remainder as a dividend. Okay, Like we said earlier, if you can't find anything to do with the, the earnings, there's nothing to invest in, then pay it all out as a dividend. However, if there are lots of projects on the table, invest in all of those projects. And then what is left, then go through there and pay that as your dividend. It doesn't matter what happens in terms of the pattern, whether it goes up or down provided that you are investing at the required rate of return of the equity holder. Okay. Again, there are some assumptions. As you can see there, those assumptions, they're a bit of a load of nonsense, aren't they? Okay. Yeah, they're a bit crazy. Uh, doesn't happen in the real world. There are transaction costs. How on earth the brokers make their money? There is tax. How do governments make their money? Okay. There isn't perfect information as the information is withheld. Okay. Uh, so that then brings us to, to the traditional theory, okay? And the traditional theory just goes through that and says that the pattern of dividends is important, okay? Uh, 
that there's information content, isn't there, uh, within your dividend. If, if we're paying out a higher dividend, it's usually because the business has done well, made higher earnings. Okay. Uh, if a dividend falls, uh, then that is probably because the business has performed less well than what we expected, and therefore the share price will fall. Conversely, when the business is paid at a higher dividend than expected because it's done better than expected, you would expect the share price to go through there and increase, wouldn't we? OK, uh, so there is information content within that dividend. OK, the level of earnings is important with regards to the dividend that you pay. OK, but what we have to go through and do that is the reason why it's important is because we need to go through that and talk about what we've done so already we, we, we mentioned about how there's information content within dividend that's also referred to as signaling okay uh, there is a signal within that dividend okay therefore if it's done well they'll pay a high dividend therefore there's confidence in that business and the share price will go up uh, if the earnings have fallen and there is a lower dividend paid as a consequence there will be less confidence within the business and therefore the share price will go down. So the level of dividend is going to influence the share price because of the signal it gives to the investors. OK, whereby previously when we went through and looked on the far side there at Medigliani and Miller's theory, it didn't matter about the level of dividends, whether we paid a high dividend one year, a lower dividend the, the following year or even no dividend in the year following that. Uh, because what we're saying is that that reduction in dividend is because we are taking the funds within the business, the earnings and investing them in positive MPV projects that will give a higher rate of return to the investor in the future. And therefore, we will pay out that higher dividend in the future. OK, imagine doing that in the real world, turning around and saying, well, the reason why uh, we're paying out less of a dividend this year because even though our earnings have fallen is because we're keeping the money back and we're going to invest it in some positive MPV projects and therefore you'll get a higher return in the future. What? As a shareholder, you just turn around and go, yeah, whatever. OK, yeah, the reason why you're paying a lower dividend is because the earnings have fallen. The reason why the earnings have fallen is because the sales have fallen and therefore we're not too happy with how you're performing. Therefore, we're either going to try and get rid of the, the, the directors or maybe just sell our shares and move elsewhere you know if, if you sell your shares that the price begins to go down doesn't it okay uh the other area as to why the traditional theory says that the dividends that are paid is important is also there because of what's referred to as the clientele effect and all the clientele effect says is and it, it's bringing it back if you like to the fact that by saying there's there's no tax, there is tax, okay? Uh, because different individuals will invest within different businesses because they like that pattern of dividends that are being paid, whether it's a percentage of your earnings, uh, whether it's a dividend that grows every single year, they like that certainty, they like that knowledge, okay? And the reason why is because maybe it might go through there and suit their, their tax portfolio and, and their tax planning okay if you change the dividend then you will change the clientele okay because they will go elsewhere because they're therefore they're not happy with that level of dividend because that might then mean that they have to pay more tax and therefore they're not happy with that higher level of tax so therefore they'll go through sell that share if lots of your clientele decide to sell your shares then the share price will fall okay so you need to keep the shareholders happy the shareholders will know what dividend they want. They will communicate that to you as the, the directors of the business. And therefore, you need to make sure that you maintain that pattern of dividend. OK, so the traditional theory states that it is important that you maintain and communicate your dividend policy to your shareholders, whether that is a pattern that exists based on a percentage of earnings uh, a percentage growth every single year uh, then therefore that needs to be maintained okay if you change it it shows a bad signal and it also might upset your clientele okay uh, i think the last point in the notes in terms of the traditional also talks specifically 
about tax. And that is talking effectively, linking it into the clientele theory, whereby we're talking income tax versus capital gains tax. Okay. Some shareholders as clientele will invest because you don't pay any dividends and you are relying on giving a shareholder their return by capital growth and therefore they will be subject to capital growth tax or capital growth, capital gains tax. Okay. Uh, alternatively, you might be an investor and the reason why is because you like that pattern of dividends and therefore you are subject to income tax on that dividend. Okay. You don't want that pattern to change. Uh, so that therefore you are now relying on capital growth and to then pay capital gains tax. So therefore you would decide to sell your share uh, because that doesn't suit you as the clientele of that business. Okay, so there's just bits and pieces to think about in terms of the two theories, Medigliani and Miller and the traditional. Uh, have a look at what you've got there in terms of the assumptions that, that we mentioned here. Again, uh, I think multiple choice, objective test style questions could ask you what the assumptions are, select all of the following that apply. Uh, you might be asked what, what type of theory does, does this information give you? Uh, so given a specific bit of dividend content from, from the real world and start linking that in to whether that is showing what happens within M&M or whether that's showing the what happens with regards to is it there your, your traditional theory? So we've just covered, if you like, the, the, the higher level aspect uh, of your dividend theory. Do make sure that you go through and, and read the study text in a little bit of detail. Make sure that you practice the questions. Uh, the only thing that we can then go through there and add, and I will, I will chat you through it, is effectively saying, well, look, you've got the M&M &M theory. You, you've got what we look at from a traditional perspective. Uh, we, we've already really mentioned it. It is what do we then talk about as your actual dividend policy? You know, we're talking there about what are the options that you have as a director of a company in terms of paying dividends. Okay, so you've got that. Is it does it mention your, your steady pattern of dividends? So that could be there, couldn't it? Did we say before? Constant growth. Uh, it could be there. A constant payout. So a constant payout. From your earnings, you might pay 10% of your earnings every single year. Or you might have a dividend that grows at a particular rate every single year. Okay. Uh, key bit there is that both of those involve cash. So you have to have the cash, don't we, uh, to be able to pay that dividend. Also, as well, if you want to, to, to get really into it, uh, as well as having the cash, you also need the distributable profits. So you, you can go through and pay out a dividend even if you've made a loss within the year, provided that you've got plenty of reserves that are distributable within the statement of financial position. But I'm not going to get involved too much in terms of the, the intricacies of what is and what isn't distributable. If we just think that retained earnings is effectively your distributable reserve and the other ones aren't. OK, and that's the simplest way to think about it. It's much more detailed than what you have there. OK, but. If you have got the distributable profits, but you haven't got the cash, then the other option that you could go through and have is a script dividend. Okay, so a script dividend is quite simply whereby you say, well, look, you can take the cash if you want, but you could take a share if you want instead. Okay, and therefore you're getting the value of a share. It might be a little bit more valuable if there's good opportunity for growth in the future then the share price will grow and therefore you as an investor will make more money than what you would have uh, if you'd have taken the cash okay uh, and the other one that you've got there your, your other option is that you pay no dividend so maybe in some high growth startup businesses uh, that have grown very rapidly uh, and therefore that that, that 
They have investors that want a return on their investments. Uh, it's very difficult to pay a dividend, isn't it? Because when you're a high growth startup business, you haven't really got much cash to be able to pay to the shareholders. You know, the cash that you have it should be reinvested within the business to help that high growth startup grow. OK, so you could pay no dividend at all and then explain to the shareholders that they will be relying on, on capital growth in terms of the value of a business. Again, difficult to, to think about the value of a business, particularly if it's a high growth startup because it's unlikely to be listed, is it? OK, uh, but hopefully as that business grows rapidly, uh, it might then become listed sooner rather than maybe if it didn't invest heavily to start off with. And therefore, you can get that capital growth at an earlier point within the business life cycle than what you may otherwise do if you are actually trying to pay out a dividend. So don't pay a dividend. Explain to the shareholders, you know, probably your friends and family, if it's a startup business, isn't it, about the aims and the purposes of the business. And then hopefully when the business gets listed or is sold on at some point in the future, you'll make your money there from the growth in the value of the business. OK, uh, so it, it's not really a, a chapter whereby that there's any computations within it. Uh, it's more a theoretical chapter. So when you look at anything to do with theory, you've really got to read and understand the theory. So whether that's listening to this video a few times, that's up to you, reading the study text. But whatever you do, practice the questions in the chapter in the study text and also go through as well and practice the questions within the revision kit of your chosen tuition provider. Other than that, that's all that we need to look at in terms of your corporate dividend policy. Bye for now.